the leper scholar versus Israel in Isaiah 53, a guilt offering. What is his, the Messiah's name? The rabbi said his name is the leper scholar, as it is written. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God, and afflicted. And that's from the Sanhedrin 98, small case B. The belief that Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as the man Israel, that is often attributed to Rashi, is now the prevalent teaching on the subject. Rabbi Singer of Outreach Judaism, Judaism is one of the most followed on the internet in his analysis of Isaiah 53 being Israel. His analysis is very similar to Christians in that he believes the animal atonement and worship laws of the Torah are to be applied to a man. To men, actually, and women and children of the Holocaust. The Christians call Jesus the unblemished Lamb of God. Rabbi Singer says the Jewish people who were murdered and slaughtered in the Holocaust were ram guilt offerings for the purpose which might prosper of having the Jewish people return to the promised land. That would be God's purpose that might prosper in chapter 53. Rabbi Singer's commentary from his Midrash, Isaiah 53, Jesus or Israel, on Isaiah 53, 10. This was posted on his Facebook page. The end of it says, share this with all your friends. In other words, anybody can use it. So, yeah. And everybody should know that, by the way. You can't just use something that's on somebody's site. Uh, but if you're given the uh, authorization to, such as he gave, it's okay, but you still can't perjure or slander them. Mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer. I don't practice, but I am a lawyer, and I know these things. So, I'm just going to really deal with 5310. I'm not going to put his whole, go through his whole midrash or anything. I'm only, it's the one verse that you can't just uh, prove by physical evidence. He offered himself for guilt. You know, all you can do is take somebody's word for it that you did. Except there is a little bit more. In any event, I am going to read, this is in quotes. There's no... I, I didn't do anything. I, I didn't even make corrections where there's bad grammar and everything. <laughs> it's exactly as it is in his midrash on Isaiah 53 that he had posted on Facebook in his notes many years ago. I was a friend of his at the time. So I'm sharing it. I'm sharing his 5310, but I'm going to give my commentary on it. Contrasting it with his commentary and the problems I see with that, and which is not an unusual thing the Jews have always done, but in particular in the, in the times of the Talmud, Rashi, uh, Rambam, they were always writing about each other and what that person thought and this and that. So these, I'm going to read everything because it's in quotes and I don't want to, someone say I misquoted something because I'm not. So he starts out, and he quotes himself, 53.10. Hashem desired to oppress him, and he afflicted him, if his soul would acknowledge guilt. He would see offspring and live long days, and the desire of Hashem would succeed in his hand. Then he quotes 53.10 from the Jewish Publication Society. He doesn't say where the first one came from. I don't, I, I recognize it, but I don't know where it came from either. But the Lord chose to crush him by disease. That, if he made himself an offering for a guilt, he might see offspring and have long life. And that through him, the Lord's purpose might prosper. 
this translation by the Jewish Pub Publication Society uh, of the Hebrew uh, into English began in, I believe it's 1956, from scratch. They didn't use, they didn't use old texts from the Talmud era. Uh, you know, the, the Old Testament of the Christians is, a, is from a Greek translation and then into English. And translations are tough enough as it is without going through two instead of just directly one. And the and the the, the rabbis and uh, scholars on language uh, who were involved with that process for many many years um, began with the uh, Leningrad Codex, the oldest Hebrew translation of the Hebrew uh, not translation, the oldest uh, Hebrew Bible. Um, <laughs> written in Hebrew, I don't know. It's here, and, and and they they translated it. It's it's one that's been used for for hundreds of years. So then, uh, after giving these two verses of fifty three ten from different sources, here's what he has to say. Not only are we stuck with the same God punishment, God situation here as we were before, this one is even more per perplexing. Yeshua was supposed to be the sinless, unblemished lamb that died for your sins on the cross. And yet it states right here that if he would have acknowledged his guilt, he would see offspring and live long days. The JPS, Jewish Publication Society, rendering gives a little different twist to an already sticky situation. It says, parentheses, if this were referring to Yeshua, close parent, that the Lord chose to crush him by disease. I don't know if you can classify a cross as a disease or not, but I don't think hanging and being crushed are the same thing either. In fact, according to John's gospel, not a single bone of Yeshua's body was broken. Of course, this was stated so he could be equated with the Passover lamb, and John is the only one that compares Yeshua to the Passover lamb. But how could this be speaking about eternal Israel? Very easily. The offering of guilt in this verse is actually literally translated as guilt offering. The significance between the guilt offering and the Holocaust is so astounding, even as grotesque of a thought as it is, I could not overlook it. A guilt offering is defined in Leviticus chapter 7 and goes something like this. The guilt offering is a fire offering in which all the parts are to go up in smoke, and the high belongs to the one making the offer. I mentioned before that during the Holocaust, Hitler not only burned Jews in the ovens of Auschwitz, but he also used their skins as lampshades and their hair as stuffing for pillows. He sacrificed these people's on the altars of ovens and kept their hides as his portion, but not until he worked and starved them to death. So, after the atrocities of World War II, the Lord's purpose had prospered because the land that was sworn to us is once again being inhabited by its rightful owners and is awaiting the final end gathering. A guilt offering, uh, that's it, that's it for the quotes. That's his commentary on verse 10. A guilt offering is a sacrifice made for unintentional transgressions. It was distinct, distinct from the biblical sin offering. The transgressor furnished an unblemished ram for sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem, as well as in cases of sins against holy idols, theft, commission of fraud or false oaths 
with monetary compensation to the victims for their loss. Plus a markup of 20% of the value to cover the priest's earnings. That's a guilt offer. An offering for guilt translated by the JPS says he offered God chose to crush him with disease so that he would offer himself for guilt. That's the literal translation. The literal translated is he offered himself for guilt. Doesn't say anything about the guilt offering. Doesn't say he became the guilt offering. And God took his life. Doesn't say anything like that. The Jewish people murdered in the Holocaust had not made any unintentional transgressions against Hitler and did not make monetary compensation to Hitler if they did. It is the people Israel that makes themselves an offering for guilt and Rabbi Singer analysis, though he seems to be saying Hitler made a guilt offering to God of blemished rams. Now these aren't the, uh, this isn't the unblemished lamb of God, the unblemished rams of God for guilt offering sacrifices. These were all just regular people. Everybody has some sins in their life. So they, they technically, you know, if this is what happened, I really can't figure out what he's done here. But I do, I do my best. I try to keep an open mind. But you, you, you can't offer an animal in any of the offerings that's blemished, defective, sick, diseased. You can't offer them. God won't accept them. And, and human beings are not a part of an animal sacrificial and atonement system, system of learning, learning what sin is, learning it can cost you. You might have to give up your prize to animal if you want to be forgiven by God. And it teaches you how to cook your food. It's a system he did away with through his prophets, Isaiah chapter 1, Amos, Psalms. He, he, told, he told the Jewish people, not only did he say, do not sacrifice your children, which they were doing to a fire god all too often, <clears throat> but he told them, I no longer want your animals. Stop sinning is what it all boils down to. And this is even picked up in the book of Hebrews of the Christians. Basically, Jesus said, God no longer wants bulls and goats for sin. He has prepared my body for sacrifice, for sins. The final sacrifice. His body prepared by God. I don't believe that any more than I believe God would accept a blemished lamb of God. Because, and I've, I've already shown the videos, you cannot dispute it. It's, it's written in the scripture with how he manipulated and lied and changed verses. He's a liar and a deceiver. He's a false prophet. He prophesied five times of his return and he never did it. And he even said, it's going to be quick, it's going to be quickly, it's going to be quickly. But it's been over 2,000 years. But basically, it was his generation. When he was born, everybody alive at that moment is his generation. When they're all dead, his generation's over. They're all dead. He said, I preach you shall see me return. Sounds kind of vengeful, kind of like... The movies you see with the fellow getting ready to be electrocuted and tells the warrant, I'm coming back. Harsh you. You, the people of Caesarea, there are those amongst you who will see me return. No, they didn't. You, members of my twelve, there are those amongst you who will be alive when I return. No, they didn't. My favorite. Book of Revelation. The great story of destruction of all things and Jesus comes and the Jews that don't believe in him are not only killed, they're put in hell. Judaism doesn't even believe in a hell. If they don't believe in Jesus, well, why would you believe a liar, a deceiver, in a book of lies and deceit? People who believe in human sacrifice. 
being healed by the blood of the death of another. Do they not want to be responsible for their own actions as it is? It's a sick, sick religion. And if you knew God as I knew God, you would know how repulsed he is at the thought that he would offer a human sacrifice to anyone, much less the Gentiles. He doesn't get any... You, you sacrifice to the gods the man is there to receive favor. What favor did the Gentiles give God with their presence in heaven? The continued sinning? I've been told Jesus won't just forgive your sins if you accept him. He's going to forgive all the sins you make the rest of your life. Because he already knows you're going to do it. So he's forgiven it. I walked out thinking to myself, i got carte blanche. I can go do anything. I accept this Jesus. But no, I don't accept Jesus. Indeed, I don't think he ever existed. I think he's a story. And I have good reason for that. But let's get back to God murdering his children. I don't think Hitler offered them. So here's these rams. Somebody had to offer them, so God's going to offer them. Not unlike he offered his son. He, uh, there, there's no explaining. And I haven't even finished it. So, Hitler sacrificed these people on the altars of ovens. These, these ovens to get rid of bodies of fire had become altars. And kept their hides as his portion. It's very interesting. Because in verse 11 of Isaiah 53, the righteous servant who makes the many righteous receives as his portion the many and as his spoil the multitude. The reference is to the people he's making righteous, the many. Many will be made righteous. My righteous servant makes the many righteous. Your portion, the many. You can keep your followers. <laughs> Maybe they'll donate to your, uh, your cause getting God's temple rebuilt. But I gotta, I gotta wade through rabbis like this, and Jews for Judaism, and Michael Skoback, who basically just ignores ten. It's so simple. If you're gonna use Israel as the man to be identified in Isaiah 53, who's supposed to be God's representative, like Moses in the day of the Lord, but if you're gonna use them, you're gonna have to use them as God used them with Moses. You gather every single one of them. They had to agree to a man. I want to know when all Jews got together as one and were plagued by God with disease and brought to grief with sickness, that they would offer themselves for guilt to God. Be given long life. And make the many righteous. How many people did the murdered Jews of the Holocaust make righteous? How many of them sold their children after that? None of it makes sense. And Hitler's portion, is it him? Did he make the offering? Why is he getting a portion? Is Hitler the righteous servant of God? That's what he's saying. It's, it's mind boggling. And, and yet, he's got thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish people believing this. And I'm that man. I'm God's representative. I am his Moses. And this is what I got to wait through. Those people that follow Toby, they'll throw you out of a group so fast for even suggesting, hey, it, it could be Elijah for the same purpose. They both have to make people righteous, bring them back to Judaism, and they both have a, have a task which might prosper. God's purpose in Isaiah 53 is not stated. We don't know it until Malachi 3, which is, which is uh, where God announces the day of the Lord. And he says, I'm sending my messenger, who is Elijah. And I'm going to return to my temple suddenly. That's, that's his purpose. Okay, so picking back up. 
Rabbi Sanger seems to be saying that Hitler is the man of Isaiah 53 who makes an offer of Israel, the Jewish people, which again would have to be all of them if you're going to call them Israel, as a Leviticus land guilt offering. And he and Hitler receives as his portion their hearts. Isaiah 53, 12 says God's righteous servant, which is Israel, and we're, and we're using the six men of the Holocaust as Israel, as best I can tell. Because the the rest of the Jews, another six million, didn't offer that six million up, and that's not what he says. He's saying God did it. Because God's purpose was, I want y'all back in the promised land. So he murdered and created the Holocaust. I guess he raised Hitler up for that purpose. And I don't think so. I don't understand thinking like that either. I, I don't get it one bit. But that's me. I couldn't believe it when I read this. I really couldn't. And I'm the man who offered myself for guilt. The guilt that the Jewish people feel from not being righteous. Which is why they're sick and suffering in the opening verses. Who are the witnesses? It's not kings as everybody seems to think from chapter 52. There's a reason they're in quotes. But, and then God says, well, you got to be suitable for my purpose. And the purpose is I want you to go make these sinners, these people who are sick, emotionally sick, from being unrighteous by being my righteous servant. That makes them any righteous. But you got to be made ready. And I have a process you're not going to believe. It's like getting a cadet ready to be a Marine or a Navy SEAL, except multiply that by about 10 million. It's in his power. And with me, he came to me in the womb to make certain that I lived a life of suffering, filled with disease and injuries and or just many other things. It's in the book. He came, he went to the womb, he, he came to the womb with Jeremiah to make sure Jeremiah was a priestly, godly man. <laughs> I was the exact opposite, an atheist for 50 years. And I had a furious spirit, just like Moses and just like Ezekiel. So, verse 12 of, of uh, chapter 53 of Isaiah says, God's righteous servant is exposed to death. He is exposed to death by disease, from an affliction by God. God chose to crush him with disease. Then he says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward him because he was exposed to death. It's a disease. It's a sickness that can kill you. With me, it was cancer. There's other diseases that can kill you. Skin cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, untreatable lung cancer. And here is my proof that I offered myself for guilt. I said early on, there's no physical proof, but there's some indirect proof. I was told I had no more than a month or so to live to be prepared to die based on pictures of my lungs, each lung. The doctor said, you see those? This is after colon cancer and chemotherapy for colon cancer. That should have killed me. And he says, you see all those white spots all over your lungs? He says, every one of them is cancer. It's growing cancer. It's too advanced to even treat. You should have come in earlier on your colon cancer. So everybody get checked if you think you might have a problem or when they say you should go get checked. And um, he said, this, this spread quite a while back. I don't know why they hadn't already picked it up. They didn't pick it up until after the colon chemo. And I haven't seen a doctor since that day. Just walked out of there, trying to die. You know, quit work. <laughs> just walking every day. Uh, you know, I get stunned. I, it's just hard to say. In many ways, I, I guess I was in denial. They said that's part of it. I just, I didn't even think I was really going to die. And, uh, you know, for the most part. And that was when the planes hit New York. That's 20 years ago. When I was 50, about seven to eight years after that, with the doctors, is when God first spoke to me. And again, I had been an atheist for 50 years. I knew nothing. 
And one of the first things we did that week, he said, let's go to the bookstore. You need to buy a Tanakh. My response was, what's a Tanakh? <laughs> I didn't know anything. I had kept away from religious people. And basically, he was with me. He made sure I did. He orchestrated many things in my life. He t early on, he took me on visions uh, one, two, three a week as part of the teaching and just starting out the preparation process before the pain started getting really bad, uh, which has been up every year since. This is year 13 since he spoke to me. But uh, as you can see, he was starting to make a little headway. Um, five years teaching me, five years writing blogs with the are the chapters of my book, Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord, which is dictated to me by God, just as the life of the righteous servant of Isaiah 53. That's my life. And he dictated it. God is my ghostwriter. Um, they're very interesting. And that's how I know all these things that all the great rabbis and the rabbis today didn't know about. That's my proof. Look at the proofs that Moses gave to the Israelites so they would believe that God had really sent him to have them released and brought back to the promised land. It's in the Torah. Moses says, who am I? I did the same thing. Picking back up with this, I'm getting there to the end of it. So, Exposure to death, that's not, that's not dying. The righteous of Israel does not die from the sickness they are given. Now, I don't know in the Holocaust when they were plagued with disease, if everybody had to be plagued before they were gassed and shot. I think the answer is no. I mean, and, and then to go out and teach this, this no more longer fits Isaiah 53 than the man of the moon obstructs God. Because this is God's representative in the day of the Lord. And it is so easy to find. Jeremiah, see a time is coming. The land blooms again. See a time after, it's after desolations. Go look at, at, at uh, Isaiah 61. He talks about, he's not talking about the exiles. He's talking about the Russian dispersal in that chapter. The ruined cities and everything being restored. That's today. The Temple era exiles that returned didn't do anything with the northern kingdom. It was inhabited by Gentiles. They didn't restore Israel. And I don't know other than the temple that they restored Jerusalem. But it's been restored today. See, your time is coming. I'll make a new covenant with you. So there it is, you have it. When the land blooms again, which simply put means the Jews will come back, and I'm going to come back. He's just waiting. I don't think he killed six million people, murdered them in the most horrendous atrocity I've ever thought of. To make them come back, that's not him at all. God's like, he's like that old crusty dad that just says, uh, you know, I made all this for you, this big branch. I did it all. I struggled and I've always dreamed of you taking it all over and continuing our name. And he looks up and his son is in a dapper suit with a suitcase and says, going to the city. And the rancher repeats what he just, what I just said. And the son says, no, I, I don't really want it. No, I mean, it's a nice place, nice land. I know you like me to tend it for you and take care of it and, and exalt his name in doing so, making it beautiful, building him a house, a new house if he needs one. But no, I don't go to the city now. Now, I realize he's not getting pushed out by the, by the Romans. But, you know, 2,000 years went by plus with no one really coming back to restore it. And that's how the scripture read it, and that's how he writes it. I know all the practicalities, Zionism, and everything else. But the fact is, they, have, they did return in 48, create Israel, and blooms again. Jerusalem's rebuilt. Uh, Jeremiah 31, two times to come have been fulfilled. Okay, we have a new covenant. There's only two covenants unfulfilled in the Hebrew Bible. The covenant of friendship that God grants when David, the Mashiach, is here. And Malachi 3, the day of the Lord. Now, the chapter of the day of the Lord. 
And it's the change day of the Lord from all the different references and five or seven other books of a day of terror and destruction, of horrendous plagues where evil is eliminated from the human race. But the good stay. Okay, well, that's never going to happen. That's not God's. That's just fun story for antiquity and even today. I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> I watch zombie movies sometimes. <laughs> Talking about the resurrection of the dead, but I don't believe the dead are resurrected. I have too much knowledge, science and medicine, and just plain common sense. That's not happening. The Orthodox pray for the resurrection weekly because of Ram Bam. He's got 13 fundamental principles of Judaism. The 13th is belief. You have to have belief in the resurrection. But where are you going to put the million Israelites in the Exodus? Where are you going to put all their ancestors who were in Egypt for 400 years? People who didn't even cook their food. Because God had to teach them with the animal sacrificial and atonement laws. Bring your animal to a fire. Now share in it. At least the priest teach it. Teach it. It's better eating if you're going to not drink the blood. Okay, part of the laws, rules, and commandments. You got to cook it. You can drain it all you want. You need to cook it, and that's what that was about. And he did away with it. And even Jesus did that. God no longer wants animals for sin. He's prepared a human body for it. <laughs> that was never intended for a human body, and God knew knew what the Gentiles were going to do. They were going to come up with an unblemished lamb so they could get sin free. And that's why Isaiah 53 describes the man as blemished and with defect by some of the words, if you look at their definitions up with synonyms, serious injuries, just, just an entire life of misery. I am the man of Isaiah 53. I match every verse. My midrash will show you that and show you how all these things that I'm talking about, of course, they're in the book. Um, I am the exact opposite of Jesus Christ. I am the blemished, disfigured prophet of God. I'm not a lamb. I'm a man. I can't be used for the human sacrifice system if anybody's thinking about it. Because I'm the righteous servant of God. They think, oh, that'd be a good sacrifice. That'd be good. What I want to see, now that we all know the Jews are the righteous servant. Of God, all of them. There's seven million in Israel, seven million in America, and I don't know how many millions in Europe and across the world. I'll just say 14 million. When are they going to make the world righteous? They say they're the righteous servant. When have they made the many righteous and a multitude as one man, Israel? It, it's so far from fitting. It's just as far as Jesus Christ fitting. They have taken this concept. Him and Jews for Judaism, Michael Sobach and his cohorts have taken this concept and this idea and they can't back it up one bit and yet they have convinced because of their unique personalities, very, very jovial, very nice to listen to, very intelligent, but with false teachings and Thousands of Jewish people believe this. It's Israel. You, I can't even mention it could be Elijah, much less a Gentile. But that is exactly what God did so he could have his vengeance and vindication against Christianity by saying, you know what? My Isaiah 53 describes a Gentile. I come from Adam. I wasn't allowed to go through Adam with Moses. I come from Adam. In the time of that's Christianity, a sow and a dumb. I'm coming from Christianity, and he says in, in chapter 63, and of the peoples, that's his people, the Jewish people, none are with him. It comes with the Gentile. And it's for his vindication against the Christians because he knew what they were going to do. And Jesus is a Jew. He can't fit it. He's not, he's a, he's not from the stump of Jesse. He's from the failed ancestral tree. He can't be the man of chapter 11, the anointed, Mashiach, 
who is described in 53. He can't be him for so many reasons. His lies and deceits. Now maybe other rabbis who've seen these things, like the Zacharias, the riding the ass into Jerusalem, and he says, I'm going to be crucified there by the Gentiles. When you look it up, and he says, all the prophets write this of me. Well, there's 20 prophets in the Jewish Bible, and not one of them says it. What one does say is the Mashiach will ride it, uh, ass into Jerusalem, which basically means he's going to be a humble man that doesn't have to be created by me. God's making sure Moses ended up being the most humble man on earth, and I know why. It's because of how God treats you. But I got too much of David that I have to show in the purposes that I have. My, my spirit is still furious, but the good thing is, I don't feel the fury inside. He can have me talk like this, like I'm furious, and I'm fine. We stop this, I, I won't even hardly remember saying any of this. It's, a, it's incredible. The stories I could tell people once this gets going, just sitting around there, you know, for those who truly believe. Uh, and, and the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, to not believe it is it's really to tell me you'd have never believed Moses. You'd, you, you, you and your ancestors would have died in Egypt. You wouldn't have gone. You'd have stayed. You can't use animal sacrifice for human beings. It, it's just it's mind-boggling. Absolutely mind-boggling. Okay, let me see where I'm at. I think I'm about done. You know, when Toby Singer says in his commentary on 10, and I had this in quotes, so I pulled that out from that. He says that this phrase, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, is interpreted by Rabbi Singer to be, quote, actually, literally translated as guilt offering. Now, he is very well known for interpreting the Bible of his own without using anybody else's translations. And his people listen to him all the time to see what the translations should be and how maybe the Christian Bible got things wrong or even the Hebrew Bible. I don't think we've ever seen that. <laughs> but in particular, a lot of these people are uh, Christians who have converted to Judaism or they are Jews who were Christians just by how they were raised. And then, uh, I guess, Messianic Jews, too, sometimes. But they look to him for translations. And look what the words he uses. Talk about the septic. Actually, literally, translated is guilt offering. The JPS, a panel of men who work their lives at interpretation of translations, they didn't come up with that. Rabbis from Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, and then linguistic uh, experts, from universities, well esteemed, well pedigreed, and they don't say it's actually literally a guilt offering, and that's what God's saying, so let's use his animal sacrificial system. And in Toby's case, let's, let's offer up six million Jews. You see, none of that works, and Hitler done it, none of it works. So, what he's really saying is, God just murdered six million Jews. To scare them all back to the promised land. That's all he's really saying. Does anybody think God did that? I don't. I don't. I don't even think when he says he put a plague against them in antiquity that he really did it. I think the plague was just there. No different than the pandemic we're under. Well, much different, but that's just the way times were when you didn't have medicine and people didn't cook their food and this and that, he would tell you. He said, but he took, I took credit for him to, to scare him. I had to scare these people to death. You know, the fellow goes up to Moses. Moses, you go talk to them and come tell us what he said. We're all going to die. You know, you feared God. But not today. Even Judaism is starting to get into the Christian thing of God wants a personal relationship with you. Well, you better go back to the mountain if you think that's true. That's not who he is. You're starting to associate him as a human being. That you want a relationship. That doesn't mean he does. 
That doesn't mean he doesn't want to to do the things he says he's going to do for his creation. He's got a different perspective. He's not human. He is an entity, a being, in existence that does have emotions, but he's got absolute knowledge and absolute power. He thinks it, he puts it in a vision, he wills it to be. There is a process which goes by with his elements of the unseen, primarily, primarily his power. You know, we have all this water on there, and Moses' name was pulled from water, this and that. Do you know that there's tiny microscopic particles of water, H2O, in outer space? He drew it with his power from the far corners of the universe to his planet. He decides everything, and that's just the way it is. And he doesn't care for the fact that the rabbis have decided to stay in antiquity in the, in the dark ages. And anything those people came up with which fit their world, but can't possibly fit our world, they need to change. He expected more of them. They're dismissed. This is the reckoning. I'm bringing it for him. But he orchestrates every single word from my mouth. Bottom line? Bottom line. This is it. Let me finish up with this. Who receives the long life? I want to know who receives the long life. Because it's not Hitler and it's not the victims of the Holocaust. Who receives the long life? No one. Would God accept an animal sacrifice of blemished humans from the Gentile Hitler? No. He wouldn't. He not accept human sacrifice, period. Were the much less ram sacrifices for guilt. For, for being guilty of, of destroying stuff, stealing stuff, theft, this and that. Um, it's not the guilt we're talking about. There's verb and adverb or verb and noun. This is the emotion guilt. They said they were sick. Okay, the man's called the righteous servant. What do you think happens? They're, it's because they're sick because they feel guilty of the sins they've made against God. And in their lives, and with their family, maybe they tore their family up having an affair, anything. Those are the people who are sick, who, who who need to understand that God does work people of little faith, that God does do the what He says He's going to do, and He does it in the manner He's always done it. He selects a man, and for the day of the Lord, He described him. He knew how difficult it was going to be in this age of secularism. Atheism, you know, got me, I'm an atheist. But he taught me up well. And after the five years of learning, the five years of writing, we had over a little over a year to put the, the first book together, Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. And then just recently, that was a year and a half or better ago. And then here just recently, he just all of a sudden had me write The Life of God's Righteous Servant, dictated it to me. And it didn't take seven days to put it together, although I'm still tinkering with it, changing things, which makes me feel like I'm part of it. He does that for me. I always feel like I'm still myself, still make mistakes and errors, this and that. But when I'm dealing with his stuff, <laughs> I don't ever worry about it because I know he's doing it perfectly and perfectly as he wants it. Were the victims of the Holocaust crushed with disease? I don't think so. I've never heard such a thing. Are the six million murdered Jews of the Holocaust all the Jews gathered as one man? No. Did God murder six million Jews? No. Have the Jewish people as one man made the many and multitude righteous? No. The six million murdered in the Holocaust sure did. The people of Israel are not God's righteous servants.